You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. I'm still gonna melt every city on the planet with liquid hot magma. And the villain himself has absolutely arrived. Ladies and gentlemen, the tyrant of tallness, the monarch of magma, the sultan of swimming slowly out to the ocean. Where he will inevitably peacefully die and create another ecosystem. Arch-tempered Zora Magdaros! And he comes with what many people will call a disappointingly small amount of changes, which I will argue make the fight significantly better than it previously was. But first, it's time to give you a little advice on how to topple this turbulent turtle. Starting off then, the fight is actually somewhat difficult now. You need to do things. You have a time limit. Get out of the La La Land everyone is in when they fight Sora and take things seriously. To begin, let's talk about what you should bring. Magma cores have significantly more health and spew out magma significantly faster and of course with more damage. Prepare for this either with Temporal Mantle, a weapon that can block the eruptions, or just with careful play. Breaking these are paramount to the fight as they do a little chunk of off-screen damage to Zora when the part actually fully breaks. If you are really, really struggling with getting through these, Consider putting some part breaker into your build to get rid of them faster, but it does take a lot of skill-based real estate. If you wind up at the barrier with these still up, it is physically possible to get back onto Zora and finish what you started. But while we don't know the exact damage of a magma core break, it is likely that this would be a damage loss over just railing the silly sausage <laughs> with cannons. Heavy artillery. What a skill to have to pull out. I know, I know, it sounds like an absolute joke, but trust me, adding an extra 20% damage to pretty much your entire barrier phase makes the fight, well, at least 20% easier. No shit, Sherlock. If you feel you are lacking in the damage in this phase, consider putting the pro transporter skill in your set as well to help you move those cannonballs just that tiny little bit faster. Survival is a surprisingly sticky situation, so seeking some serious supplements to boost your chances isn't a bad idea at all. The two ways you will die in this fight other than being silly and just standing there twiddling your tumultuous thumbs are either from the Super Saiyan rocks or from the Nergi up top. Bring Temporal Mantle. It's... this isn't a suggestion anymore. It is the simplest, solid solution to magma cores, and it will just let you forget about the eruptions for at least one of them entirely. My personal highest skill recommendation is health boost. This will help you in all areas of the fight, but fire resistance is a close second. The only reason it falls behind is because it doesn't help you with an air gigante at all. Oh god, no! I never actually paid attention during regular Zora because you could complete them by just standing there and waiting for the timer to go! Is there anything you can actually do to make this an easier experience? Well, other than the magma cores that the game makes absolutely blindingly obvious, there is another thing that the game makes obvious that is a thing that could actually blind Zora if you hit him in the eyes. The st stalagmites? Stalactites? Oh god, the comments are going to be full of pseudo-geologists seething about my stupidity on the subject of slag. Oh, wait! There are both types of them! Stalactites and stalagmites! Either way, make sure you pick up a stone from the ground, and by ground I mean his solid, solid body, and position yourself well enough to knock these onto old man mountains back when you get the chance. It isn't worth doing over a magma core, but if you get the opportunity, it is just free damage. If you want to specifically prepare for them, there is one on his left and right at the beginning, one on his left as he moves forward. Long live the king. <laughs> and then two right above him when he stops for Nair Gigante time. Remember when your old pal Mr. Spiky Pants showed up on regular Zora and you got up to make a sandwich and came back when he was gone because it was a timed event that you didn't have to do anything for at all? Well, now you actually have to actively repel him. Sadly, we didn't get a sneak peek at the arch-tempered Nergi we were hoping to see, or even a tempered Nergi for extra difficulty. It's just a normal little Elder Dragon eating Elder Dragon, with the main difference here being that you have to actually get rid of him yourselves. This step is shockingly substantially salient. Due to this shortened quest timer of 25 minutes. 25 minutes? 25 minutes. 
This stage of the fight could very well be the difference between a kill and a fail, as if Nergi has not been repelled by the time Zora breaks free from the binders, Zora will only walk forward on two legs as he's standing straight up, which will drastically slow his progress towards the barrier and leave you with significantly less time at the place you will inevitably do most of your damage. This is the only reason I hesitate to recommend builds that only have part breaker and utility skills. This phase is based on damage, so bring whatever you have to bring to get rid of him as soon as possible. Though, there is a way to do both of these, and I swear on my left little pinky toe that I will tell you awfully soon. Man, that is a lot of stuff to worry about. You sure you're talking about Zora? Zora Magdaros? The mindless turtle zombie that craves his own death in the Everstream instead of brains? I am, and guess what? That is only the first half of the fight. Once Zora manages to meander his molten mass to the barrier, he opens a whole nother can of worms that you have to try your best to stuff back in before they get into all the apples. Because nobody likes eating an apple with a worm in it. Does this have a worm in it? No, no, good. How about this one? I'm not sure. The worms in this case are cannonballs, so your main goal during this phase is to shove as many of those babies back into the can that is Zora himself. Your overarching goal in this part of the fight is pure damage, the most of which can be achieved by loading and firing the cannons, with the most efficient singular space being the ship that you can jump down to. As well you load the cannon in the middle, the NPCs will load the cannons on your left and right, so you can essentially be able to fight so that you can essentially be able to fire three cannons in the amount of time that you would normally only be able to fire one. But beware! Beelining your butt towards the blessed ball-based carnage that is the cannons will ruin you inevitably, as you do actually have to protect the goddamned wooden barrier from the creature made of wood's natural enemy! Damp wood termites that live on the cool California coast. No, not that one. That one! and Capcom have made the lava, as it is no longer magma once it leaves his body, have at least somewhat more realistic of an effect. Zora's fire-based attacks will chunk off about 40% of the health of the barrier each, and for the continued continence of the ramparts of repulsion, you must interrupt them. What do you mean by interrupt them? Oh yeah, did I not mention? It was part of regular Zora too, but due to the tuning, no one ever considered it relevant. But you can flinch Zora out of an attack by either using the one-shot binders or the holy sword itself, the Dragonator! Which, by the way, you can use more than once. It has an 8 minute cooldown in this quest, so make sure you use it early after arriving at the barrier in order to make full use of two instances of 6,000 damage. It's under 9,000! Which in multiplayer is buffed to 12,000 damage! It's over 9,000! Yes! 12,000 specifically! It's over 11,999! How do you know when to use these methods of flinching? Well, you know those little talking heads on screen that are a mix of super creepy and super annoying when they say the same thing a thousand times in a row? Well, it turns out they aren't just saying the same thing over and over again to piss you off. They are saying it because it is a warning when something is happening. Just about every callout tells you what is going on. The main important one here is Zora Magdaros is charging up energy which the handler will say before he rips the ever-loving shit out of that hastily constructed structure's somehow trackable health bar. This is the moment in which you use the one-shot binder or everyone's favorite spitting death spike. Hey! But Cotton, there are only two one-shot binders at the barrier. Here. And here. And I need far more time than just two will give me to finish him off! Well, it's your lucky day, isn't it? Unlike regular Zora, the one-shot binders, and also the cannonball piles by the way, will replenish a short amount of time after being emptied. This means that you should be able to rotate around and never really run out of them, meaning if you are on top of it, the only time limit of the fight is the literal time limit of the fight. Wow! A couple of general things then, is you should avoid doing this quest as a party of two. Palicos do not come with you onto Zora's scary shell is they are little pansies. Meaning, if you have two players, which activates the multiplayer health modifier, but no palicos, you will have the hardest time getting rid of the magma cores, and can easily get thrown off of him when he reaches the barrier, with one of them still intact. If you really want a min-max, you can take advantage of your deaths. You unfortunately can't farcaster at any point during this encounter, but you can fairly easily get yourself killed in order to switch builds. Using this tactic, you can actually create multiple 
builds, one full of part breaker and fire resistance for magma core breaking, one full damage for Nergi repelling, and one with heavy artillery and pro transporter for the barrier section. If you just time your two deaths well, meaning you can start with the part breaker build, die when Nergi spawns for the damage build, and then die again for the barrier build. If however you are in a four person hunt, it is entirely viable to just dedicate a single person to this utility role with part breaker and pro transporter, and just keep them killing cores and loading cannons while the rest of the party deals with Nergi and flinching Zora. That said, the only thing I would consider actually properly necessary is the heavy artillery. If you stick heavy artillery in your normal damage build and just play well, you can easily finish the hunt with a few minutes to spare. Alright, that pretty much sums up all of the changes and individual importanties, so how does this all line up when you put it together? Eat before you start the quest, time is important, land on Zora, murder the middle magma core, move to the front magma core, temporal mantle, and destroy! Nergi should land around now, drop everything you are doing, and rush over to ruin his meal. Once he is gone, temporal should be back! Finish the magma cores that you have remaining, and have a nice cup of tea while Zora finishes taking his little walkie. Lay into him with cannons, ensure a flinch after the relevant callout. Use Dragonator early to allow for a double Dragonating. Oh yeah! Job to good. Now that you know how to deal with this carnivorous clan conglomerate of magma, it is time to shove the brakes on and relax a little. He's dead. You did it. I know. I know. It was surprisingly intense. But now that you've killed him, what do you think of him? First and foremost, check out his armor. You can finally make decent crit status build, which will add so much variety to the game, and you bet your sweet little rumpus I've already constructed some really damn cool ones in my head. But what are your opinions on the fight itself? I've been taking notice of people's thoughts on Arch-Tempered Zora, and the community seems completely split on him. Half of the community loves it, and half of the community essentially wants to quit Monster Hunter now. And the reason for that, in my mind, is quite simple. If we say that the original Zora fight was a 1 out of 10 on the enjoyment scale, and Arch-Tempered Zora has made it a 5 or a 6, this would cause this divide. The people who love the fight are simply admiring the fact that a fight that was previously a 1 is somehow now a 5 or a 6. It's a crazy awesome change to make, and it's actually interesting. The people, alternatively, who hate the fight are upset that the fight is still only a 5 or a 6 compared to some of the other monsters. Sure, it's a bit better, but why should that matter at all if it's still not as good as the rest of the fights? I'll tell you exactly why. It is the precedent that this sets. And it is actually a repeat of Val Hazak, as far as I'm concerned. What this Arch Tempered does is bring out and highlight the actual mechanics of the base fight. The things that were originally intended to be difficult. For Val, it was his miasma. It was laughable, even up to tempered. But in Arch Tempered Val, you had to plan your entire fight around healing through it. Unless you were a high damage build with a health regen augment. And Zora does the same. How many people here didn't even know that there were one-shot binders on this quest? You, uh, you can't see me, but my hand is raised right now. Regular Zora was sad, laughable, and AFKable. But for Arch Tempered Zora, Capcom has really pulled out the stops and pulled out the stoppers on his difficulty and upped the intensity of the event. Magma cores now feel like you have to actually deal with them, and they are much more of a threat. You can't just ignore Nergigante, you have to actively fight him and actually use the mechanics that are already in place. The flinching him to stop the barrier from breaking is fantastic, and the fact that the barrier is actually in danger of breaking in the first place is even better. Sure, you could argue that it should have been this way in the first place. Why are people happy that this is a semi-enjoyable fight now? But you have to admit, they found what they needed to change. They fixed the fight that people complain about the most in this game and made it an actual experience you are properly involved in, rather than just the world's slowest roller coaster. The lineage of the Arch-Tempered title may have had its ups and its downs, but this one is absolutely an up, and it shows that they are onto something when it comes to making unthreatening monsters threatening. Now they just need to take that into account and focus it in the right way. I may not be the first person to say this, but I absolutely firmly believe that the arch-tempered system should be properly repurposed at the lower tier monsters. Imagine fighting a Toby Kodachi that could actually put up a fight against your endgame gear, and then reward you with some cool armor, or an Anjanath, or even a Rodobon. It not only puts variance at the endgame, as what most people fight these days is pretty much exclusively the 5 or 6 Elder Dragons depending on the system that you use, but it lets them put a spotlight on monsters that they worked 
hard on, and some of which they undeniably scored a home run on, but they had to put them aside to make room for the more powerful enemies. Supposedly, Zeno is next. I don't honestly know how I feel about that. As well, Zeno isn't a monster that we fight very often in the end game, which is a positive, the Zeno fight was already an 8 or a 9 out of 10 for me. Improving on a score like that will be a massive, massive undertaking. And if they can do that, then I'll be right here, gushing about it, non-stop. But it will be a lot harder than what they've done with Sora. That's for damn sure. I've been Cotton Dinosaur. Like if you liked the video, subscribe and hit the little notification bell for more. But most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet.